important discussion about taxes to offer a bit of an Alberta frame based on research that Parkland has done recently and also to hopefully as a component of the presentation itself as opposed to later in the question period where there will also be space for discussion. I'm really hoping to make this participatory so don't go to sleep, I'll call on you. Let's figure something out. Let's figure out how to tackle taxes and inequality here in Alberta. Um, thanks, Jerry. Thanks to all, Jerry, all the tech people here. You're doing an amazing job, all the volunteers. None of this could happen without the work of everybody who's not necessarily on the stage with me, but fundamental to what's going on. So I'm going to start with the problem of inequality. Uh, we've heard a lot about this lately. It's, it's become a fundamental topic that we talk about that the media talks about, that politicians talk about. This is a common idea up for discussion. Uh, and there's good reason for that. Inequality is a real problem and a growing problem around the world. Uh, we can uh, take a quick look at it just in an Alberta context. This is a slide that shows real income gains in the province over the past 30 years or so. Makes pretty clear who has won and who has lost over the changes we've seen in this period. Uh, in terms of income distri distribution, Alberta is more dramatically unequal than any other Canadian province, and the problem is increasing in severity. Uh, since 82, real income growth in the province has been highly concentrated in the province's top income earners. Uh, you see the inflation adjusted average income for the bottom 90%, 99% of income earners in the province increased about 13% in this time period, uh, topping out at about $48,000. Uh, meanwhile, the average incomes of the top 1% and the top 0.1% respectively grew 93 and 149%, as you see reflected on this slide. This growth in reported incomes for the richest Albertans translates into some pretty phenomenal figures. We're looking at uh, income gains of over $300,000 and over a nearly a million and a half dollars for the 0.01% here in the province, or the 0.1%, excuse me. A bit of data that came to light just recently over the past week or so, I think really puts a frame, uh, and a really important frame on what's happening here in Alberta in terms of inequality. You know, as inequality has become more into the spotlight, uh, provincially, nationally, internationally, Canadians have often heard, yeah, it might be getting bad here, but it's not as bad as the states. The states are worse. A lot of the sort of hardcore criticisms of inequality that we've seen internationally have been directed at what's going on south of the American border. Well, we can turn that around and direct it at Alberta at this point. In 2012, the province's top 10% of earners here in Alberta took home 50.4% of all income, or all income. This makes Alberta more unequal than the United States. As a jurisdiction, we're doing worse than our neighbors to the south. Their top 10% of earners take home about 48% of all income. So inequality, of course, though it is worse in Alberta, is a problem nationally. It's been, uh, Canada has been recognized as one of the most unequal countries in the, wor in the world, according to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Award-winning work by a pair of economists here in Canada has made clear that income inequality in Canada at this time is as bad as it was in the Great Depression. Think of that. That's a period in our history that is still, still looms large for many as a period of extreme inequality, a period distinct for the hardships that were endured at that time. We're there again. Inequality is also apparent globally. At the 2011 World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, Income inequality was singled out along with corruption as the two most significant problems facing the world. Earlier this year, the Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs at the UN said that the world's attention should be given first and foremost to the issue of inequality, which is a major cause for social turbulence. Inequality, or the gap in incomes between the rich and the rest of us, has been called the eighth wonder of the world. Uh, according to a key and highly reputable source. <laughs> so inequality is a global problem of devastating proportions. But it is also a problem that we've grown accustomed to hearing about. 
My argument today is that discrepancies of wealth, whether globally, nationally, or provincially, are not necessarily the real problem with inequality, at least not from a progressive perspective. The real problem with inequality from a progressive perspective is not so much that it exists and is growing, but that this, how the societies we live within can talk about it without actually doing much about it. Inequality has been so widely reported, both because of what it does and also because of what it doesn't do. And what it doesn't do in and of itself is push the envelope force people to think about how to address the problem. So here's an academic perspective that might help us understand the problem with inequality through the concept of the Overton window of political possibility. In any given public policy area, such as education or healthcare or infrastructure or taxation, uh, only a relatively narrow range of potential policies will be considered politically acceptable. And this window of politically acceptable options is defined not by what politicians necessarily prefer, but rather by what they think they can support and still win re-election. In general, then, the Overton window shifts to include ideas, uh, not, or shift to include different policy options, not when ideas change among political leaders, but when ideas shift in the society that elects those leaders. So the way you push the Overton window then is by talking about ideas that fall outside the window, ideas that are outside the range of concepts that we're all used to hearing about. Expressing and thereby legitimizing outlier ideas renders the unthinkable thinkable, and then doable, and then, if we're lucky, public policy. So just talking about inequality as a problem represents a relatively weak means of pushing for social change. Because it is a condition, not a needed reform, sure, but also because inequality currently sits within the Overton window. But there's good news here. While inequality lies within the Overton window, the key political and economic tools through which to address inequality, the possible solutions to the problem, remain outside that window. Talking about reform in these areas, linking inequality to its potential solutions, has the potential to broaden the range of public policy options under consideration here in Alberta, to in effect push the window. So today, I'm hoping that we're gonna go beyond talking about the problem of inequality, to paving the way for the collective search for solutions in the realm of fiscal policy. I'm going to focus in particular on what we've discovered through our Alberta-focused, politically engaged research on the topic of personal income tax. But in working to build a more engaged political culture on this issue in Alberta, it's of course not enough to just be book smart about these issues. So our session today will also create space for all of us to think together about how to connect what you know about Alberta and about Albertans and about the tax dialogue we have in this province to what Parkland has learned through our politically engaged research on this topic. So here's the division of labor I propose for the rest of this session. Me and you. I'll start by, after this brief explanation, asking you all to do a bit of brainstorming out loud here. What do we know about taxes? What do we hear in this province? What's the Overton window around taxes at this time? We'll bookmark what we say there. Then I'll offer some data based on our work at Parkland Institute to ensure we've all got the essential research background around this question. And then I'll flip it back to you. And we'll connect what you know and the data I've shared to think about how we can most helpfully engage those as tools of social change here in the province. How can we use Parkland's recent research to broaden the public discussion of this issue? So let's go. What do we know about taxes? Are taxes a treat? Are people like, oh goody, it's tax time. Here I go. When you buy something at the store and someone says you have to pay GST, are you like, yes?
I think that's a really interesting observation. So in things we read, we learn somehow that we don't like taxes. That's something we're told about ourselves. That's fundamental about being here. There's a, there's a term go against the provincial sales tax. Provincial sales tax, bad news. Bad news. Taxes in general, bad news. with my dad about uh, how much was being taken out for taxes and he talked to me about uh, that goes to pave roads, that goes to help other people who don't have as much, it, it goes to help others and I didn't have a problem with that and I've never had a problem paying taxes uh, but the media message, the political message that is here in Alberta is very much we pay too much in taxes. I think that's a really interesting contribution and contrast it with what we heard uh, from the woman earlier about how the public frame around these issues is taxes are bad. Though the frame in our home might be quite different. The way we understand it as individuals might be inconsistent with what we're told about ourselves. Okay, I'm going to take um, maybe, I'll take this last one and then We'll hold on to what's in your brain, because remember, we're coming back to that after, and there'll be other opportunities to engage. Well, I think most Albertans don't know much about taxes, and so I honestly believe the flat tax happened to us. Without most Albertans really knowing what a flat tax is and what it does and what it doesn't do, and whether they like it or don't like it, it's just here. All right, a lack of knowledge around taxes. I swear that's not a plant, but I am going to segue to my research now. <laughs> It seems it's necessary, so I'll, I'll, just, I'll just dive right in. Thank you. Thanks, all of you, for that. And there'll be other chances for others to engage. So what do we know about taxation in Alberta? What do we often hear about taxes? We've done that. What do we know about taxes in Alberta? Well, we know that we're a bit different than other places. We know that the other Canadian jurisdictions, and indeed the vast majority of jurisdictions around the world, uh, all maintain what are called progressive income tax systems, uh, in which people who make more money and thus possess a greater ability to pay more are obliged to contribute a greater proportion of their income in tax. Uh, as many of you know, this is not the case in Alberta. About 15 years ago, Alberta introduced what we colloquially call the flat tax. Uh, so Albertans who make enough, all Albertans who make enough to pay personal income tax, pay tax at the same rate, regardless of whether they earn $20,000 a year or whether they earn $2 million a year. This slide here provides a quick visual that suggests how Alberta differs from other Canadian provinces in terms of personal income tax in the context of the flat tax. It illustrates the lowest and highest tax brackets across Canada uh, in the, the provincial jurisdictions. It makes clear how in Alberta, low income earners in the blue um, pay among the highest rates nationally, while high income earners in the red enjoy the lowest tax rate in the nation. So what Alberta looks like from a tax perspective varies a great deal depending whether you're paying at the upper end or at the lower end uh, of, 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 or whether you would be paying at the upper end or at the lower end based on your income. This slide represents the average tax rates for almost all Canadian provinces by income level. Uh, it's helpful in relation to what we often hear is the, the supposed advantage all Albertans enjoy through our tax system. Uh, for comparison with Alberta, British Columbia on, and Ontario are of particular interest. Between incomes ranging up to $110,000 per year in Ontario and to up to about $150,000 in British Columbia, Alberta taxpayers pay more personal income tax. For example, at an income of $60,000, um, an Alberta income earner pays about 50% more in personal income tax than an individual earning an equivalent income in either British Columbia or Ontario. And I know this is not necessarily the most uh, clear slide, so let's talk, let's fall over a chair. Um, let's talk about it in more detail. So this is um, in thousands here, so we're, this is, represents the $150,000 income per year. 
Over here is about 60,000, 100,000. So you see that the Alberta line, the black line, over here at very high income levels is clearly far below the other provinces. Hello, uh, although if you enjoy a more moderate income, you would in fact have a tax advantage, if we want to use that phrase, if you lived somewhere else. <clears throat> So the so-called Alberta tax advantage actually only exists for those making at least $150,000 a year. This table shows the situation across Canada for those making $300,000 per year, clearly a high income. Uh, at those high income levels, Alberta's average tax rates sit far below those of the other provinces. Uh, relative to the other provinces, an Albertan making $300,000 per year enjoys a tax break of at least $7,000 per year. So if you're in Manitoba, PEI, Nova Scotia, and you're making $300,000 a year, you're paying between $47,000 and $52,000. If you're in BC, Newfoundland, New Brunswick, Ontario, Saskatchewan, $35,000 to $39,000. Alberta, tax advantage at the $300,000 income level. Ouch, yeah, ouch. So the introduction of the flat tax changed how much particular income groups in Alberta contribute to the total amount of tax revenue generated through personal income tax. To measure the change, we applied the tax rate system used in 1999 to 2010 income tax filers data, which is the most recent available income distribution data. The current 10% constant rate tax is then applied to the same income distribution data and the two sets of results are compared. Under the flat tax regime, Albertans making less than $75,000 per year are subject to a 4.6% increase, increase in their share of the total tax collected. In contrast, Albertans making, less, making incomes of more than $75,000 per year enjoy a 4.6% reduction in their contribution to provincial income tax revenue. So at this time, in 2014, more of our public costs are paid by Albertans making less money. So this comparison exposes how adopting the flat tax regime gave tax breaks to those who needed them the least and increased the tax burden on those who could least afford to bear it. It also underlines the importance of tax reform with the well-being of average Albertans in mind. Over the past few years, we've grown accustomed to hearing the provincial government lament its inability to adequately fund public programs, uh, including a variety of essential social services. But the government's own budget figures reveal how much every other province, how every other province raises substantially more revenue through their personal income tax system than does Alberta. And this slide here makes that clear. As you can see, the personal income tax regimes of the other provinces if applied in Alberta, it would raise additional revenue ranging from $950 million in BC uh, to over $9 billion in Nova Scotia and PEI over here at the far end. Alberta, our tax system, uh, so we don't collect anything there. The median figure, meaning half the numbers are above and half the numbers are below, is 7.1 billion. So this is a substantial chunk of change in the context of a province with an annual budget of about 40 billion. So given all of this, given how tax breaks have gone to the wealthy and the tax burden has shifted to low middle income earners, it is hardly a surprise that our research on taxes revealed that Alberta's tax system has contributed to the province's problem with inequality. The Gini coefficient is a summary statistic that can be used to measure the equality of income distribution. The higher the Gini coefficient, the greater the inequality of income. And this slide here shows the Gini coefficients in 1999 and in 2011 for after-tax income in every Canadian province, as well as for Canada as a whole. Alberta's 1999 Gini coefficient was somewhat lower than the Canadian average of 0.31. In that year, both Ontario and British Columbia had much more unequal after-tax income distribution than did Alberta. By 2011, the story had changed. 
likely as a temporary after effect related to the global financial crisis of the Great Recession, after-tax income inequality had decreased across Canada as a whole, as well as in most provinces. While income inequality had increased in Saskatchewan, it had increased considerably more here in Alberta. The spike in Alberta's Gini coefficient reflects increased income inequality in the province. So basing a comparison on 99 is really helpful because that was before the introduction of the flat tax. So we can try to isolate for the effects of the flat tax in that way. Uh, that is um, the extent of the research I wanted to offer. Jerry has given me the hook, so I'm going to get off the stage so he doesn't have to come up and collect me himself. But we haven't had time here to do the most important thing, which is to get you to connect what we know about the Alberta frame around taxes to the research that we have based on work done by Parkland and other groups. So let's do that in the question period. You guys ready for some interpretive dance? Yeah. <laughs> oh, David did show up. All right. Come on down, David. <laughs> it is true I was in the bar last night discussing taxation, of course. And, you know, some young people said, well, why would you come to, you and I, to my session? I said, well, we'll do an interpretive dance. So David was, uh, you know, talking to me, said, well, what could we do? How could we represent yeah. the flat tax? So, we got, so you were showing me last night? No, this is the flat. No, that's progressive. No, it's a Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, it's squishing us. <laughs> <laughs> He's going down. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, wait. Okay, now we're going to have a progressive tax. <sighs> All right. <laughs> Thank you, dude. <laughs> Well, you know, if you can't describe the taxation system through interpretive dance, you know, I don't know. So that's what we're all about. So, um, as you heard, I'm the executive director of Public Interest Alberta. I used to be here at Parkland Institute. And uh, one of the things that we do, I, I'm on the board of Parkland and, and Ricardo's on our board, is to take Parkland's brilliance and bring it out to the public and try and make political change happen. So. That's what I want to focus on, and, and we uh, last year decided that one of the key things that linked to all of our seven advocacy areas that we work on was the whole question of taxation, was the whole framing that the provincial government always seems to have, we're too poor, okay? Repeat after me, we're Albertans, we're too poor, we can't afford quality public services, we're too poor. And that's what they do. They keep repeating that message over and over again. How many of you heard that the price of oil has gone down? Oh. We're too poor. I'm sorry. We can't afford full day kindergarten. We're too poor. We can't afford a poverty reduction strategy. We can't afford to address income inequality, etc. So what we need to do, and, and we've heard other speakers uh, last night and this morning's brilliant, brilliant talk about moving from the research to talking about how do we communicate this information? How do we then mobilize people? And you people who are in the room are obviously here to learn all this stuff, but it's not enough just for you to learn and go, oh, that was interesting. I'm going to go home and have tea. Uh, uh, you have to then go forward and move forward and get to that critical stage of, as we heard this morning, organizing, and I would go the next step into political action. I mean, it's all political action, everything that we're doing is political action, but we need to see some serious changes in this province and in this country, I would suggest. So we distributed quality propaganda in front of you. Uh, it's there. We have 20,000 copies that we printed. We also, thanks to the Alberta Teachers Association, included this brochure in the ATA News, which went out to the 40,000 teachers across the province as an insert into their news. And thanks to the ATA for funding a lot of this campaign and our other sponsor members for that. 
And you'll see that what we've done from a communications perspective, right off the top in the name of the campaign, is talking about the choices that this government has. Just by the name of it, Alberta could, it creates a frame that allows us to have a conversation about what we could do if we had progressive taxes and if we had fair corporate taxes. And so the first thing, of course, is to give people that information. When we first launched the campaign, we did a tour across the province. Shannon and I uh, spoke uh, in the city's Red Deer North and David from, from uh, Parkland in Calgary's office as we traveled around, we connected with people trying to engage and that's what we're doing here is educating people around those things. And Shannon and other people have talked about the flat tax and the implications for low and middle income earners compared to very, very wealthy people. I think the message we have to get out is that the flat tax is not good for the vast majority of people in, in Alberta but if you're very, very wealthy, you love the flat tax. And that goes to the question of political power that we have to get at in terms of our analysis as to why we have a flat tax in the first place and how it's going to be very challenging to overturn it. And so we'll get to that uh, discussion of political power at, at the end as we go forward. Corporate taxes, of course, um, have been cut for many, many years, both federally and provincially. Uh, Alberta now has the lowest corporate taxes in Canada at 10%, second lowest is 11.5%, and on upwards from there. Each percentage point of corporate tax cuts today is worth approximately $500 million, okay? Saskatchewan, that overtaxed province to the right of us, has corporate taxes of 12%, which is nowhere, the, the national average is 12.6%. If we had the same corporate tax rate as Saskatchewan, who currently has the same uh, you know, economic growth and stuff going on there, we could bring in an additional $1 billion a year. Saskatchewan's entire, if we had their income tax system, as Shannon put up on the chart, just their entire income tax system, keep in mind it starts at 11%, then 13%, and then 15%, we'd bring in $3.1 billion more. We're not suggesting that we go to increasing the taxes, but we're saying if we went to 13% on anything earned over $100,000 and 15% on anything over $150,000, that calculates out at another billion dollars. Hence, the $2 billion at the top of this. So on the Alberta Could website, we have a, a tax clock. We like to take a little poke at the Taxpayers Federation to sort of, uh, with their, uh, debt clock, etc. cetera, well, we can have a tax clock too, and, uh, and that's what's going on there. What's critically important when you're doing communications around this, I think a lot of people's eyes glaze over, oh, I want to talk to you about taxes. It's like, oh my God. No, what you want to talk to people about is what kind of society do we want to live in? What matters to you and your family? And then frame the tax discussion in that regard. And that's why the Alberta Could campaign is structured the way it is. You'll see on the second page here, Alberta, Alberta could invest in quality public services. And these that we put in here don't add anywhere near $2 billion. But they do raise some points of some political things that have happened over the last number of years. We cut the summer temporary employment program that provided jobs for 3,000 students every summer and provided uh, support for 2,400 nonprofit organizations, $7.1 million, a tiny amount of money. It would basically take our tax clock a day and a quarter to fund the summer temporary employment program. We need to put it in that perspective. We need to talk about um, the commitment that the PC party ran on in the last election and has been there since the, um, um, Commission on Learning to, to reduce class sizes. So we've, we've calculated that out. We're talking about those early years. We also need to talk about quality child care. We're talking about seniors care. All of these things that we're hearing day in, day out in the news are critical problems that matter to us, that are part of our lives, but that somehow, what's the mantra again? Alberta's too poor, okay? 
could easily, easily fund this stuff, and then more moving forward. And we are going to be posting a number of things over the next little while. Full day kindergarten was a promise made by the Conservative Party in the last election in 2012. How many of you heard about them talking about full day kindergarten since then, since the last election? Not at all, okay? They're not moving forward on that. That's a $200 million promise. We're saying in our uh, report that we're releasing with the Social Planning Council and the College of Social Workers on Monday on child poverty, that we absolutely could fund uh, half the schools out there having full day kindergarten. It would make a huge difference for many young families. We absolutely could address poverty. The family and community support services programs across Alberta that is supposed to be 80% funded by the province, 20% funded by municipalities, do frontline preventative poverty work. And that makes a huge difference, particularly in many, many rural communities. I was at the Alberta Urban Municipalities Association uh, meeting this year, and uh, mayor and councillors after councillor got up to the microphone and lambasted our new human services minister for saying FCSS funding from the province has not increased since 2009. What that means is, is municipalities are either having to cut these FCSS programs that are preventing poverty or put more in. So one mayor from Northern Alberta got up and says, we're putting in 40% now. Another one said we're putting in 60% instead of 20%. So they're you know, cutting in one area, but it's causing impacts on other areas going forward. So when we're doing our communications and we're mobilizing people around this, Again, I think people respond better to a positive frame. I think people want to see how this matters to them. We're connecting into what people need. And um, we also then need to get it out to our organizations, our, our support and stuff like that, which is why in here we have people and we're going to have a lot more folks. Albertans speaking out for more investments. So Jeff Carlson, as I was just talking about, is the head of FCSS. Uh, board of Directors, he's a city councillor from, from Lethbridge, spoke the, head, the chair of the Alberta Students Executive Council, Lori Sigurdsson, I'm not sure if she's here, some of these people, Elizabeth Ballerman, others, and there's many more that we want to get out speaking on it. You'll also see at the top of that a poll which I found very encouraging. When asked about uh, what, would you, what are your top priorities in terms of if there was a $2 billion, what would you like? And the general, as we heard, feeling is, is that because all Albertans hate paying taxes, if you listen to the Taxpayers Federation, you would think 95% of Albertans would go, cut taxes, if you've got an extra $2 billion, cut taxes. That's not at all the case. 47% of Albertans asked what their priority would be, said invest more in public services, okay? Another 21% said we need to build more infrastructure. So we know that we haven't been keeping pace with our population growth and our inflation, that we have to build more schools, we have to build hospitals with roofs, uh, with ceilings that don't collapse and flood, et cetera, uh, on and on and on. So the, so the message is getting out there. How many people said their top choice would be reduce taxes? 4%, okay? So what we need to do is we need to break the myths. We need to be talking about Albertans about what type of society we want to live in, and we want to recognize that we are actually in the majority. But to then mobilize people, as we heard this morning, we need to move into not just having conversations here in this room, but for you to take these and the other 20,000 copies that I have in my office uh, and distribute them and put them out there and have conversations. How many of you belong to unions or are involved in unions? Excellent. I mean, that's... That's to be expected, all right. So what is your union doing about the whole question of flat tax, progressive taxes, corporate taxes? Is this integrated into your discussion as a strategy? How are you mobilizing as unions around that? Some of you are on various executives. How are you getting that out there? I just spoke to close to 1,000 nurses on Wednesday, and we distributed all of these, and they're, they're getting it. I spoke to AUP convention uh, last month to 1,000 delegates, et cetera. So we're getting this stuff out there. But again, it's not enough just to t have those conversations inside your unions. It's about organizing and mobilizing and making the connections between the fact that we don't have a quality, uh, affordable childcare system in the province, we, and we have serious problems with our seniors' care issues, et cetera. 
the next line out of your mouth is, well, we could, of course, afford it. This chart that's on here, Shannon referred to how much the difference would be in personal income tax. If you look at this chart, nicely supplied, thank you, by the Alberta government after the last budget, I had to harass them and threaten to go to the media if they wouldn't give me the detailed numbers because they just had a nice little graph without any numbers on it. What it says is $11.6 billion, right, is how much more we would bring in if we wanted to be just under the second lowest tax jurisdictions in the country. Now that's including sales tax, that includes health premiums, other things. We don't have to go down that road. Uh, uh, sales tax actually do hit low-income people significantly harder. In fact, the Alberta uh, government's budget said that in the last budget very clearly. Because Why is that? Because low-income people will spend all of their money where high-income people are offshoring their money, putting it out, etc. So Jack Mintz, who seems to have a massive influence in this province and federally, the economist from, from Calgary, absolutely saying, well, we, we want to bring in a sales tax, but not have, uh, but, but reduce or actually eliminate your uh, income tax. And we're not actually going to increase taxes overall. That's a tax shift, just like the income splitting that the Harper government put out, and Kathleen described that perfectly, is a shift uh, to, to high-end earners. So let's talk about mobilizing in the few minutes that I have left. It's critical that we um, uh, create conversations that are out there, that we use our organizational structures to, to reframe this debate, and it's thanks so much to the Parkland Institute and others who, who've done that work that I'm, I'm feeling actually quite hopeful. I'm seeing it cropping up more and more in conversations. I'm seeing it in letters to the editor fairly regularly now where people are saying, well, hang on here, this question about seniors' care, we can't address it in terms of long-term care. Here's the process and here's the taxation structure that we have to move forward on it. Politically, we know that Alberta has the worst campaign finance rules in Canada. You can, uh, in an election year, wealthy, wealthy people, or anyone in this room, if you have it, can give $30,000 uh, to uh, a, a, a political party. That's a huge amount of money, think about it. But if you make a million dollars a year, and you know that the flat tax means that you're actually paying $33,000 less in income tax in Alberta than if you lived in BC, or get this, $74,000 less and if you lived in Ontario, $30,000 as a campaign, that's a good investment, you know, because that's, that's, the, that's the way you go forward. So the 0.1% or the 1% absolutely understands that they love the flat tax. And they are willing to back their campaigns of the political parties. The Conservative Party uh, over the last number of years has gotten close to 70% of all their campaign contributions from corporations, okay? So of course the corporations are saying to them, don't you dare touch our, our uh, increase our corporate taxes. In fact, we want our corporate taxes put uh, even lower. Similarly, similarly, very, very wealthy people. So we know that that's the dynamic and that they're the, the campaign finance of the political parties, the conservatives. The Wild Rose, interestingly enough, came out saying that they're opposed, that they want to get rid of corporate and union funding uh, just like we have federally and like uh, Quebec and Manitoba have. They did the analysis because actually they have uh, only 25% of the Wild Rose uh, money coming in is actually coming from corporations, so they know it would hurt the Conservative Party more than it would hurt them. But make no mistake, they are very tied to a lot of small business people who in turn certainly don't want to increase corporate taxes or increase uh, taxes on very wealthy people. So uh, what we have to do is to use people power. That's what we have. And people power is all about knowing how to communicate very clearly, having materials, getting people involved, organizing at the, gra uh, at the grassroots level, and, and mobilizing. We've been quite successful in getting these ideas out into the media ourselves, but it is not enough for me to get on TV or what have you 
We absolutely need all of you to be involved as we go forward. And over time, it's not going to happen overnight, over time we're going to shift this debate in this province. I am convinced of it, and I'm convinced of it because of you, the people in this room. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much for both being so timely. <laughs> uh, now it's time for, for you folks. We have split this pretty much perfectly. So Shannon, uh, you, do you want to remind folks what, what you are hoping to discuss uh, in, this, in this period? Sure, basically I think it, segued, it segues really nicely from what Bill was talking about and the collective strategy developed uh, so successfully by Public Interest Alberta. I think thinking about what we can do as individuals based on research, based on our understanding of the province, based on what um, people who work on this know makes for success. I think if we can have an airing of ideas around this, maybe we can inspire each other a little bit. Of course, other sorts of questions related to either presentation are, are more than welcome here too. Great. So yeah, we've got a mic runner. We're going to try and uh, uh, and be as fair as possible in this, in this whole process. And uh, first time speakers are going to get preference from me, and uh, we'll try and make sure that the dudes don't uh, take over the all the the talking. So we have a speaker or a questioner right here. What I find so frustrating is Alberta is in boom times. Look at our cities. Look at the cranes. Look at the people making big incomes, and we're wasting the boom time. We're not collecting the money we should. We're not building our schools and our hospitals and our health care. And why, when they say we're poor and we have no money, why do not the media people say to them, if we don't have money in boom times, when are we ever going to have money? Is that directed at one person or another, or just in general? Okay, we'll take a couple. Anyone else with a comment? Uh, here's one right here. I, um, you had asked about what Albertans think about taxes, and I was fortunate enough this summer with HSAA and the National Union to run a tour talking to Albertans about taxes. And I can assure you, we were all very surprised, and most Albertans don't like our tax system. They want fair taxes, and they know it's not fair. Um, but we do need to find ways to activate people and to talk to each other. We can't just let this rest here. So um, people are ready, though. People are. We just have to keep going. They need a good push yet. Great, thanks. We're going to go to uh, the lady right here. Oh, right, right over here first, and then in the back corner will be next. Oh, right here, yeah. In the spirit of Know Thine Enemy, um, I think an absolutely brilliant strategy by the Fraser Institute for at least the last decade was Tax Freedom Day every June. That beautifully encapsulates the idea that finally you can start earning money for your own family and for yourself. And media coverage is unbelievable every Tax Freedom Day in June. I think we should take them on directly. <laughs> Great, thanks. Do we, can we take one more right in the corner, yeah, sure. in the back corner there, Count? So I was just wondering uh, what we do when we move to a uh, progressive plan about closing the tax loopholes. Because no matter how progressive it is, when you get let these people hide their money, you're not going to get the true tax value out of uh, the progressive tax system. So. Okay, that's great. Oh, uh, very good questions. Um, uh, in terms of the tax tour, I th that's exactly what I'm talking about in terms of unions being able to connect not just with your own members, but you guys had the, the tax fairness bus going to festivals, doing all of that. That, I mean, HSAA and other unions that are supporting this conference really get how critically important that is and get out to do that. And I think. Uh, Jerry was a big part of uh, helping, to, helping to do that as well as the National Union going forward. The Tax Freedom Day, Yvonne, I, I uh, think I, I couldn't agree with you more. I know CCPA has been doing stuff in terms of the highest tax bra uh, bracket. I think on January 1, uh, they, they kind of like, well, eight, eight hours in, here we are for the wealthy. <laughs> their, their tax freedom is. And I remember years ago, actually, in the 90s, 
The AFL, the Federation of Labor, did a brilliant thing. They actually it took, some, it took some doing. They actually got a couple of pigs and they had the corporate race Right, with which the media loved, and they had the, the, the pigs running to, to eat at the trough and stuff like that, talking about the, how, how corporate uh, taxes, they, you know, it's a little complicated to, to organize, but, but I think those sorts of uh, uh, ideas resonate in people's mind, and the Fraser Institute is, uh, I hate to say it, brilliant at, at how they have been successful in convincing people that oh, they're coming to steal your money, and or that somehow co cutting corporate taxes means there's going to be more jobs. Cutting corporate taxes is actually meant, I uh, had some stats here, in 2011 to 2012, the cash reserves in uh, corporations, not including the banks, excluding the banks, increased by $72 billion, up to about $575 billion in cash reserves in Canadian corporations, not counting the banks. That's $72 billion in one year of dead cash that's thanks to ca corporate cuts that are now just sitting there and not going. And so they know for a long time that it's actually not increasing jobs by these tax cuts. It's just in, in, in wealthing them as, as we go forward. And absolutely, the tax loopholes, Canadians for Tax Fairness is a new organization actually chaired by Diana Gibson, who used to be Shannon's predecessor, the research director. She's out in Victoria now, and they are looking at the tax loopholes that are, that are out there, particularly all the offshoring. And I was at a conference in, in McGill that Kathleen Flaherty and I, or, or Kathleen was just speaking at uh, uh, earlier this year, talking about just how many billions of dollars are being offshored and moved to these corporate tax havens. But internationally, we need to be involved in, in, in challenging that. So, so we, you can assure us that there were no animals hurt in the, in the <laughs> operation of that particular media stunt, and, right? And the uh, pigs did belong to unions. So they were union, union pigs, pigs. yeah. Union <laughs> pigs. <laughs> no, <laughs> let, let's take that back. Not union pigs, right? No. <laughs> yeah, no. Shannon. Uh -huh. um, Yes, there have been so many great comments. I agree with all of you. I think it really is a moment of possibility here. That's the thing that I was going to say in the wrap-up about the, the Overton window and how inequality sits within it. If you start talking about taxation, you've got the potential to move it. And that, that, that space can be uncomfortable. You know, you can sort of feel, well, I know I hear that most Albertans agree with me that progressive income tax would be a good thing, but still it feels strange to get out and say, I like to pay my taxes, I understand why they happen, I understand how it builds a better world for everybody. But it can still feel hard to do that. That discomfort is actually a moment of possibility. That's the moment when you're pushing the envelope. That's the moment where you can recognize that you're doing something that will lead to change for all of us. And just with respect to the question about uh, tax loopholes, absolutely. There's a lot of money heading out really fast, and we can't even track it at this point effectively. So there's the need for research, there's the need for communications around this, there's the need for greater understanding. Canadians for Tax Fairness is one group that's really working at it. My hope is that if we can start taking back the language around taxes, it will get easier and easier to tackle the range of issues that need to be tackled. If we can win, progressive income tax will be better positioned to win on the variety of other things that need to be tackled. Great, so we had a question here and, uh, and then just up here. Uh, maybe like a little more of a, a comment um, about like the, the sort of like propaganda, I guess, around this issue and like the, like um, I used to live in a conservative riding and, and we would always get their stuff about like, oh, well, can't we have to stop the socialists and the idea that like, you know, more taxes equals like socialism, but like what does socialism actually mean, you know, and what actually is that and, um, and, uh, yeah, so just, uh, I, I'm, yeah, appreciating your comments on the importance of, like, challenging people and, 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 you know, and unfortunately, my father makes these comments to me often, and so I have to try and see, like, well, what do you actually understand socialism to mean and, and what, yeah, the idea of, like, you know, you actually have, having conversations about what kind of society you actually want to live in and how um, important that is. 
Um, anyway, thank you. We're trying to be good for the camera here. Okay, go ahead. Um, I, <clears throat> I'd like to share my own experience with everybody that madness sometimes really helps. I landed a few, about 12 days ago, I landed in Fort McMurray, kind of by mistake, because I was on a cheap flight to Ontario. And I traveled from, there had to be an in-between landing in Fort McMurray after Edmonton, and then we went to um, uh, London, then we went to uh, Toronto, Ontario. I saw on that plane that I traveled with several people who work in the oil industry. And it was so crazy to see people with tattoos on their arm. I was almost going to think, I need tattoos on my arms too. They were all the, the typical workers in Fort McMurray. And I would have loved to stand up on that plane. I actually tried, <laughs> but it was not so successful because of in-flight rules and all that kind of stuff. But now, to come to the point, how do you break through a barrier like that when you travel with all kinds of people who make tons of money in Alberta, fly in and out. I will never forget the day that I was at the Parkland Institute and the first time that one man came from Norway to explain what they do with royalty taxes in Norway. It blew me away and I feel that we still, with that wonderful, powerful information, the idiotic thing that we don't have even what you could call a minimum royalty tax in Alberta is so scandalous. That is a very good way to organize a coffee party or a street party around. It will make people mad. I like madness for a good cause. Great, thank you. Uh, we're going to go over here to this gentleman over here. Uh, we're not going to talk about your carbon footprint having to fly to Fort McMurray before you. <laughs> well, that's for another conference entirely. Hi. Uh, my question is simple. You mentioned something about the politic implications. So what I can change is by voting, right? So yep. I think this is the first thing I can go vote and maybe do a change. So with all this talking, you have two supreme power. I can say the PC party and what rose. So if you go voting, if you vote with something else, you're pretty much throwing away your vote. It means that with the general discussion. So my question is, what are you doing on the political scene, if it's possible to answer to this? And if you're backing up or anything, if you are behind of any political movement. Should we take two more questions and then uh, we will do, and then we'll take the last five minutes and, and summarize. So right here, uh, right, right beside you, there. Thanks very much. One of the things I think we need to talk about more publicly is tax credits, it all the tax expenditures that Kathleen Leahy referred to. It doesn't do you much good to collect a tax credit that you won't get in fact and you won't get it till next year anyway because you're having to give up your job to stay home and take care of somebody. And other kinds of ploys that people seem to accept, things like the deferred property tax, yeah. which simply cost us all more and mortgage somebody's property after death. That's just so unfair. Great. I'm going to take one more. There was a gentleman back here, right there. Yeah, I remember I see, saw a hand here this way. Yeah, um, I think I counted four separate articles in the Edmonton Journal this week, plus a column from Graham Thompson today that talked about the flat tax and that they're suggesting that Prentice is for the first time giving serious consideration to this. And I'm just wondering if, if you, uh, maybe I'm being a little overly optimistic, but do you think do you take that seriously? Do you think that's uh, and what can we do to help make that possible? Beautiful. Do you want to go first? Sure. Is there, maybe uh, Verna, just uh, do the last one. Sorry, because Verna's had her hand up. Who's there. in charge here? <laughs> Come on, wait a second. Now. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Bill, you're in charge. Thank you for that, both of you. Uh, building on that uh, with. Premier Prentice saying that, I think now Albertans only understand money, and unless they're making over 125,000, as you say, they, there's two provinces that are already lower tax brackets for them. It's costing, yeah. what did you tell me, you know, difference for $60,000 a year. 
And <clears throat> any rate, I think that message is a very important one because we're brainwashed with this being, <clears throat> Alberta being the lowest tax bracket anywhere in Canada. It's news to them that they're being schmucked under 125,000. That won't affect some of the workers who make a lot more than that, but it does affect a lot, a lot of people. So uh, I think that's one message that really can get out. Yes. Thank you. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right, okay, uh, great questions, great comments. Uh, the, 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 I want to respond to the question about people not living here and the challenge of the nature of Alberta as a community that brings in people to work who maintain a primary identity and taxpaying status in other jurisdictions. That's a real problem and it plays into how we construct taxes. Um, if taxes are something that you do as a community, if it's part of your investment, if we take the perspective that Kathleen Leahy was explaining to us in the previous session at the start of her talk, as, as taxes as that fundamental expression of a common connection, then to not pay taxes where you live and work becomes something strange. It becomes different. It becomes odd. It becomes unacceptable. So I think there's a real possibility in changing the frame around taxes, taxes to increase social pressure on people to change their behavior in relation to taxes in a way that's potentially beneficial for Alberta, given Alberta's nature as a society. So again, I think there's a lot of power in how we talk about taxes. Um, and we, I think that's, that's great. That's a power that we all uh, have, we all benefit from too, potentially. The issue of royalties versus taxes. Yes, absolutely, we need what we deserve for our resource. That's, that's, that's fundamental. However, royalties and taxes are very different. Royalties are what you pay for the raw material. The costs that um, corporations involved in natural resource extraction impose on our province do not relate to royalties. Corporations need to be taxed appropriately as well as to pay um, royalties to uh, offset costs of the resource they take. So there's the issue of royalties in relation to natural resources. That is fundamental. But in terms, if we're talking about providing services to Alberta, if we're talking about paying our costs as a society, as a society that wants to offer the sorts of services that allow people to live a decent quality of life, regardless of background, regardless of the particular challenges they face in their individual circumstance, we need to talk about taxes. That conversation has to relate to taxes. It can't relate to royalties. Um, and then finally, are we in a moment of possibility in relation to taxes? We have to say yes. I mean, we have to try for it. There's, 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 there's no other way around it. That's the hopeful way to live. I think that there is a, a, a moment of possibility here. These bubbles up to the media are coming from somewhere. They're coming from somewhere. Uh, it's time to get our perspective out there. It's time for Albertans to start talking about how they actually see taxes as opposed to the perspective we read about ourselves in books. And I think there is, there is a moment here. Great. Thank you, Shannon. Great questions, great comments. Um, you know, the, I, I, I get the, the notion of trying to talk to your dad about these things and being in conservative writings, right? We all have those family members, etc. And, and we, have, we have to have those conversations with them. Like, it's good to talk to your dad, right? So, but you need to connect with them on, on the, as I said before, what matters to them and help them understand uh, those things. So one of the things that people say to me is, is, well, why should we pay taxes to have a quality child care system? I don't have kids under the age of six. And I say, look, it's like saying, why should we build a road to Fort McMurray if I never go there. It actually is important that we have a road to Fort McMurray, even though I may never go there, but that it benefits us all. One of the things that was, I was uh, speaking with Kathleen at a national child care conference last week in Winnipeg, there's an economist that actually showed that the Quebec child care system, uh, which is $7 a day and, and much, much more uh, tax dollars going into it than we have, actually pays for itself because they have 70,000 more people, most of them women, in the workforce in Quebec because of their childcare system. But then those people pay taxes, and those taxes actually result in about a 1.75 rate of return. 
So if your dad's really conservative, say, yeah, we should put a, a lot of money into childcare because that's going to resolve some of our uh, issues with respect to the, the job crunch that's going on. It's going to help more people go back to work because that's what conservatives like. And Well, they don't like women working, let's be clear here. But, you know, <laughs> hence the income tax splitting stuff. But and that it actually pays more back. So you have to think about those arguments and frame those things going forward. It's like a tax, and so the idea that Carol raised about these tax cuts or tax expenditures, et cetera, and how they actually don't benefit the majority of us. We have to break those myths. This income splitting that Kathleen talked about that we were all hearing about, $2.7 billion going to the very, very wealthy. I think what we need to do is organize some, some political actions in the lead up to the upcoming election where you have a whole bunch of people there going, not benefiting me if, you're, if both families are, you know, if both couples are, are each earning $50,000, that income splitting is absolutely useless. A single mom, absolutely useless. useless. We're, uh, some of you may have heard John uh, Kolkman speak uh, earlier today about uh, the report that we're putting out on Monday about child poverty in Alberta. I just have to ask, are there, is there any media in the room here? No? Okay, good. Uh, no. Oh, I'm live streaming. Okay, cancel that. So <laughs> gonna, we are doing press conferences on Monday. I didn't want to scoop ourselves here. Okay. Um, okay, I won't go there. But <laughs> the, what, what you will hear on Monday is absolutely appalling in terms of the level of child uh, poverty in this province and then the examples we give are perfectly able to address child poverty and that was a commitment again that the Conservatives Party made and they ran in the last election and I know we no longer have Alison Redford as our Premier but all of the other ones were there they all were elected on that promise and that's what we need to do and so your question sir around around voting around getting involved Voting is just what happens every four years. Democracy is what happens between elections, okay? And so your involvement, your engagement on a day-to-day -day basis and getting this out there and the question around the Edmonton Journal, that's only going to happen if people are educated and constantly writing those letters, calling in, challenging the journalists. If they, are only, if they only put the Taxpayers Federation in there, check, call them up and say, well, why did you just take that perspective? Why aren't you doing your job to actually get both perspectives out there, et cetera? Why not have those debates? So uh, with that, gonna I think to we're going to yeah. thank you. Yeah, we're going to need to let our, uh, our uh, AV guys get back and uh, ready to, to go with the last uh, session of the last plenary session. Before you leave, just two quick announcements. First of all, reminder that tomorrow the doors open again at 8.30 a.m., uh, half an hour before the first session. There will be...